I'm Jared Gardner, and we're back with the third lecture. And instead of giving you guys a PowerPoint, I'm going to show you some more, um, some more cases, digital slides and pictures of some cool cases that I hope you will enjoy as much as I did. All right, so here's the first one, and I know I've not given you these to preview, but I think you'll be able to follow along and uh, see, uh, see some cool things along with me. This was a case, a 30-year-old man with, a, I think it was a four centimeter uh, foot nodule, and they, on the plantar foot, and they thought it was a cyst, of course. It's always a cyst until it's not. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a digital slide. This was uh, from long ago. Um, but I do have some pictures, thankfully. So you can see here's the acral skin, and we're down deep in the subcutis, a large multinodular lesion. And I'm going to uh, click through some pictures here. You can see that the cells uh, alternate between uh, darker blue areas and uh, more pale, kind of pink eosinophilic areas. And there are uh, multiple nodules embedded in dense, uh, dense hyalinized stroma. I'm just going to let you look at it there. There are some dilated vessels in the background and some dilated spaces in the lesion. And we're going to go in closer to those pale areas in a minute here. Now we're starting to get somewhere. The cells are, have round nuclei and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm in these areas. And then over here, they're more uh, kind of round blue uh, with minimal cytoplasm. And now as we go in closer, you can really start to see them. They really do have almost, a, uh, some of them are almost plasmacytoid maybe a bit. Uh, really abundant cytoplasm, kind of discrete cell borders, and then these very small round blue cells. The nuclei kind of between the two cells, cell types looks the same. There are some other areas that almost border on clear cell change, and then some that have kind of almost an oncocytic eosinophilic cytoplasm. There are dilated spaces, some of which have uh, some blood in them. And uh, out here at the periphery, I'll just let you look at that, and then I'll come back and comment on it in a moment. I don't want to steal the joy from you. The nuclei are very bland, and mitoses were, were very, very infrequent. I think we might have found one after hunting for a long time. And then here's a last close-up look at the, at the eosinophilic area. So formulate your idea now. Now I'm going to show you stains. You can think about what you think this might be or what your differential would be, and then I'll show you some stains, and then we can see what you think the final answer is. So for one, this is a PAS stain, kind of interesting. You can really see how it outlines individual discrete uh, tumor cells in the eosinophilic zone. And this stain, I've got a few pictures of it. See if you can figure out what you think it is. So this is smooth muscle actin. And in case you're curious, uh, uh, pancytic keratin and uh, P63 were both negative here. I believe we did both of those. So my first impression, I, I saw this case uh, as a fellow. And when I put it down at very first glance from low power, the idea that came to me was, um, was a uh, dermal duct tumor or hydradenoma, that spectrum. And thankfully, after a, a little bit of looking, the other idea that came to me, and particularly when you get into areas like these, was glomus tumor. And that's indeed what this is. This is a glomus tumor, a huge one, that uh, had uh, eosinophilic and clear cell change. And those areas uh, really kind of gave it a uh, an appearance of a sweat gland neoplasm. So I think it's an important take home. And I've, I've seen other cases since that made me think of both or that I was able to show my trainees um, and, and trick them one way or the other. Um, and so I think it's a good general rule to keep glomus tumor and sweat gland tumor, particularly the hydradenoma, dermal duct tumor, acrospiroma, poroma, whatever you want to call that group of tumors that to me look 
quite similar, have a lot of overlapping features. I think it's it's important to think about them both in the same differential, even though they're totally unrelated uh, from an etiologic perspective. And so one thing that's really helpful is in glomus tumor, and uh, Sharon Weiss taught me this, that if you, if you go to the periphery, the small round blue glomus cells tend to track away from the main tumor mass along the surface of vessels. You can even, uh, you can see it there and you can see it uh, here a little bit around a tiny vessel. A lot of times it's very subtle around small vessels, although I particularly like this shot right here because you can really see it tracking along this slightly uh, larger uh, vessel there. And so in the middle of a glomus, sometimes the, the, the features are not always straightforward, but if you find that at the periphery, that's really helpful. I have found that to be a useful diagnosis, uh, diagnostic clue also in cases of, of a malignant glomus tumor or so-called glomangiosarcoma, if you like, that um, the middle sometimes can look quite ugly and you might struggle to figure out what kind of cells you're dealing with, but then when you see it tracking away at the periphery, it becomes clear that it's actually a glomus and that can help you. And then there are dilated blood vessels in here, but they're actually quite scattered, not, not as abundant vascularity as many cases of glomus might have. So we published it because of this abundant, uh, pale, almost oncocytic kind of change and, and vaguely clear cell change as a potential mimic of, of a sweat gland tumor like a dermal duct tumor or hydradenoma. And I also want to point out, and you can really see it so nicely here, that glomus cells, um, they are often surrounded, uh, individual cells are wrapped by a layer of basement membrane. And that's what gives them the very discrete individual cell borders that become uh, quite apparent when you have a case like this with abundant cytokines. Cytoplasm. So that's what the PAS is actually highlighting here. And if you wanted, you could do a collagen type four that would would serve the purpose here. We just did it for the sake of a, of a education and and uh, demonstrating this really pretty phenomenon um, right there. Uh, in, coincidentally, Schwann cells also do that same thing. The individual cells wrapped with collagen type four basement membrane. So that could be a helpful way to tell apart like an epithelioid schwannoma from a melanocytic tumor, for example, to see individual cells discreetly wrapped. And then the actin, you can see real strong staining, particularly around the border of vessels here. We're doing that thing again where the, the glow cells are tracking along a vessel at the periphery and right here as well. But notice that many of the tumor cells are negative. And I've, I, you know, often glomus is a diagnosis of H&E. And occasionally I've needed to do stains in complicated cases like this one. And, uh, but I have found that, that actin is not like a strong diffuse, the whole tumor cell, you know, all the tumor cells staining. I feel like in glomus, you often get this kind of patchy staining. So don't expect it to be a uh, diffuse strong positive in the entire tumor. And I like this case, how it accentuates in the perivascular region. And um, of course, uh, Desmond will be negative in glomus tumor. Uh, keratins will be negative. And also, um, it'll be negative for, uh, um, for vascular markers, for endothelial markers usually. 31 and ERG should be negative. 34 is usually negative, although I've seen a case of, uh, of glomus that did have some 34 expression. But, you know, 34 is nonspecific. So, um, so anyway, that's just a, a nice, interesting variation on a glomus tumor um, and a good reminder to think about it in the differential with the nexal tumors.